Have you ever felt uncomfortable? <laughs> if not, just come stand with me. <laughs> and after communion. Uh, again, let me say welcome to everyone. Welcome to everyone online. And again, happy Easter. Um, if you were able to see the video this past week, I kind of set up what we're going to talk about this weekend. Um, and um, as we close out our series, I Am, you know, I kind of want to put your minds at this place where have, you, where, have you ever been in a place where you just felt so uncomfortable, whether it was at a, in the movie theater, which has been a while now, um, or uh, listening to someone speak, maybe even in worship, that you felt uncomfortable. You felt so uncomfortable that you actually got up and walked out. That's how uncomfortable you felt. Um, when I was a, I can never remember. It's hard for me to envision not believing in God. Amen. Now let me put a disclaimer on that. I surrendered my life to Christ at a very young age. I mean, at a very older age, specifically um, in the comfort zone of my parents. I shared with you earlier as a church, I sh um, we talked about I surrendered my life to Christ when I was 13 years of age at church camp. Um, it wasn't that I didn't believe in God. It wasn't that I didn't believe in the Bible. It was just that somewhere around there, and as my wife was telling me this week, she said, Jonathan, you're a strange bird anyway. Um, <laughs> that's a story for another time. But I... I just wanted to make sure that when I surrendered my life to Christ, it was my decision. It was my decision, not my parents, not anyone else's, it was my decision. How I came to that, I'm not really sure. Like I said, Susan said I'm strange. But that's where I was at in my relationship with God. But I came <coughs> back in vision, not believing in God. I've always had a blast in church. From a very young age, the church, my parents have always allowed church to always be my play zone, my play area. And talking about feeling uncomfortable in a ministry where my parents ministered at years ago, we used to race across the top of the pews. Um, just to inform you now, uh, we used to, as kids, some of us kids are actually in the audience as adults today. We used to race across the pews. Um, just letting you know that. Uh, we used to race across the pews, and when my parents were ministering in Indiana, we were racing across the pews one morning after service, and I was ahead, I was excited, and I was at the very end of the pew, and then all of a sudden, I looked up, and I froze right there on the top of the pew, <laughs> because there was an elder. <laughs> and needless to say, I felt very uncomfortable <laughs> during that time. I can give story after story of times of feeling uncomfortable. Um, I can remember right here in this very auditorium, as a older gentleman, but still young, um, when revivals were really the up and coming and the big thing. If you remember Duke Jones, who used to come and hold revivals for us every so often, I remember one specific night during revival, we were sitting in the back. Why? I don't know why, why again, why I was allowed to sit in the back, because usually I had to sit right here um, <laughs> in, in the comfort zone of where my mom could get to me. But for some reason, I was allowed to sit further in the back, and right when Duke was speaking, Duke just stopped. And he called out and said, Jonathan, he said, when you stop talking, I will continue. <laughs> now, that made me feel uncomfortable for one reason, but if you remember Duke, Duke was blind. Duke couldn't see. So that really made me feel uncomfortable. Unless you were right in front of Duke, he couldn't see you. So, you know, the fact that he knew back there and called me down to worship, um, feeling uncomfortable. Just yesterday, I was traveling through Rona, and in the back of a truck, it had this sign. It said, Beware of Dog. I've never seen that in a truck before. If you have, I'm not. But it said, beware of God. Next thing I know, I'm following behind this truck. And this truck, this guy is having an argument with somebody. But I can't see who's sitting in the seat. All I can do is see the dog. And this discussion, and I thought, like, they were in my path for a really long time. It made me feel really uncomfortable. <laughs> When's the 
the last time you felt uncomfortable? When's the last time you allowed yourself to feel uncomfortable in the presence of God? Did you know that whenever Jesus had large crowds specifically, he inevitably said something that made everybody feel uncomfortable? A lot of times we come to worship. Here we are, Easter. We're excited. We, we, we uh, you know, all the different things that transpire and take place. And it's an exciting time for the church, and it should be an exciting time. We, you know, it's kind of like that first love or that first kiss or whatever. We kind of get that little feeling inside. It feels so good, you know, the jar beans, the chocolate, you know, for me, uh, the coconut cake, all these things. It's just exciting time. But should Easter make us feel a little uncomfortable? You see, I think that's the way we a lot of times think our relationship with God should be comfortable. I think a lot of times that's the way we have the idea worship should feel. When we come into worship, it should make me feel good. I should have this, everything should just look perfect. Everything should just be right. We have this idea of worship. Well, if you go back and you look at the life of Jesus in his ministry, specifically we see he always gave the large crowds the uncomfortable truth. And when he was done teaching, people weren't looking, to, a lot of times weren't looking to come back. They were actually ready to leave. In fact, it becomes pretty clear as you study his ministry that he never gauged success. A lot of times in culture society, now the pandemic's kind of messed all that up. But how do we, a lot of times, even in the church, gauge success? We gauge it by attendance. We gauge it by attendance, never by by attendance or by decisions, never by how many, how many people left this morning during the message? How many people actually got up upset and left? We don't really gauge the church service that way. But if you look a lot of times at Jesus' ministry, a lot of times, if you allow me to say it, Jesus would gauge his effectiveness, effectiveness on a message, his, how, how well the, the, the message got across by how many people actually left. How many people were felt who were made to feel uncomfortable? If you go back and look uh, at specifically, Luke gives us some insight into this over in chapter fourteen, verse twenty-five. If you look there, it says large crowds. In other words, a lot of people were traveling with Jesus and turning to them. He said, "If anyone comes to me." And does not hate his father and mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Because on the same verse 27, he says, and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. In other words, Jesus is saying, don't call yourself a follower of me if you're not willing to carry, willing to carry a cross and follow me. So Jesus is saying at that audience at that time, and even saying to us, uh, even today, if you're too concerned about what family thinks, if you're too concerned about what people think to follow me, then just go home and be with your family. Just go home. Now, can you feel the tension in the room? Can you feel the tension in the crowd? Again, it goes back to, uh, I always challenge us to put ourselves there. So put yourself in the crowd and you're hearing Jesus say this. Can you feel the tension that's in the air? Wait a minute, I, I love my, my mom and dad. I love my children. I love my spouse. And, and I can just imagine that the disciples are probably over here going, Jesus, what are you thinking? What are you saying? Why are you doing this? Do you not see all these people? Do you not see this huge group of people? Everybody's coming to hear you, Jesus. We are really, we're on top of the charts, everything. They're going, why are you saying these things? Like sometimes when you come to worship and you've invited someone to come, and then you hear a message and you go, why in the world did the preacher say that? Out of all the times, I actually get someone to finally come, and then they have to hear that. Like we think again. 
Everything's supposed to feel good. Everything's supposed to be comfortable. Everything's supposed to be wrapped in this beautiful robe. Here's the thing. Truth. Truth. A lot of times is uncomfortable. Truth a lot of times is uncomfortable. As we finish up our series this weekend, I am. I want to dive into a, a time, maybe a little weird to talk about for Easter, because you would think, that, well, well, let's just dive right into it. Over in John chapter 11, John paints this, this picture for us. Um, it, it starts out, John chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now there was a man named Lazarus who was sick. He was from Beth Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, who, whose brother Lazarus now la lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So here is what's happening. Lazarus is on his deathbed. In other words, this is a friend of Jesus. They don't even actually use Lazarus' name. Notice they just say, the one who you love is sick. Now the Bible says that all of us have sinned. It's actually, if you think about it, it's one of those things in this room... There's a lot of things we probably don't have in common, but the one thing every single one of us has in common, whether it be in this room or online, is that we've all sinned. No one said amen. 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 <laughs> we've all sinned. We've all fallen short. Romans says the wages of sin is death. And that isn't just an earthly death here. It, it, it means every after all, everyone dies. This is this is much more. It, it, it actually talks about that death is a, a eternal separation. See, sin separates us from God. Which is just a really comfortable way of saying this weekend. Hell. Now, man, that makes you feel good. How many of you had a conversation about hell this week? <laughs> See, the Bible says that hell is a horrible place. The Bible says it's a place of outer darkness, incredible loneliness. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of people just don't like to, they just don't think about it. They just don't want to think about it. They don't want to talk about it. It's a hard truth. That they, 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 they just decide, well, I, I just... Have you ever met someone that, that they just have certain parts of their Bible that are just... That, it's, that passage of Scripture or whatever is not there? Have you ever had anybody like that? Have you ever met anybody when they say, well, that's not in my Bible? Yeah, it is. Let me show you. And you actually go to that page or you go to that place in the Bible and it literally is not. Why? Because they ripped it out. You ever met anybody like that? <laughs> it's a hard truth. And if you don't like that truth, it's really hard to believe it. Some will even say, well, I believe, I believe in God. I believe in the Creator. I believe God is the Creator. I just don't believe in a God who would send people to hell. Maybe even you feel this way, that way this weekend. I mean, he's a God of love. How could a God of love actually send someone to hell? And I guess it's okay if that's what you want to believe. As long as you understand that the God that you're believing in is a figment of your imagination. And not the one true God. He's pretend. You're welcome to believe that. 
See, the one true God has spoken clearly, and he said that all of us have sinned. And what we deserve for our sin is actually hell. We have to come to terms with that. Before we can celebrate the resurrection, we all have to come to terms with the fact that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short. It's not about looking at someone over here and you're looking at this person and you're saying, hey, well, I, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm better off than they are. Again, I'm going to commit sin number, you know, I've committed this sin, but they've committed this sin. We look at all these different sins and we put people on all these different levels. Yes, the consequences for sin could be different. But sin is sin. And sin separates you from God. Amen. And we've all sinned. And we've, we're all separated from God. The only thing that brings us to God, the only thing that bridges us to God is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is the blood of Jesus that was shed for us on the cross that bridges the gap. It's a hard thing for us to accept. Some of us will say, well, we don't believe in hell. We believe in God. We believe in well, the other part of us, we, 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 we go to the other way. And some of say, well, I, don't, I, I believe in hell. Okay. But then a lot of us have the other ideology. Well, my sins aren't as bad as their sins. So I, I'm a little better off. No, we've all sinned. And we all need Jesus. It's a hard thing to accept. So here's the thing. If you look back at our text this weekend, it says that, that the word comes to Jesus that Lazarus is dying. And in verse 5, it tells us that Jesus waits two days before he even leaves to go check on his friend. Well, that sounds like a close friend, doesn't it? When he finally arrives in the village, Lazarus has been dead now and buried for four days, and there is just this heart breaking sense when he arrives. People are crying. People are upset. People are mourning and weeping. And actually in verse 20, it tells us when Martha heard that Jesus was coming. So what we see here is so when the sister heard that he was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. And Martha says to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not, would not have died. Now, do you feel the tension again in those words? If you had been here, Jesus, you would not have died. My brother would still be here. In other words, she's pointing the finger. And some versions will actually read, if only, she's, as Martha saying, if only you had been here. Now, let's stop right there. You finish the sentence. I mean, I'll start it, and I want you to finish it. I want you to have the courage this weekend to finish it. If you're standing before Jesus, you might, maybe even to this morning, you felt this Jesus, if you had only... And you finish it. See, my guess is that I bet all of us, whether it be in this room or whether it be online, have had... Or said this question, Jesus, if only you, we've had these if only moments with God. If only you would have been here. If only you would have intervened, I would still have my job. If only you would have intervened, my spouse would still be here. If only you would have intervened, if only you would intervene now, then I wouldn't have to deal with this sickness and this pain. If only you would have protected my child. If only you would have protected my grandchild. If only I wouldn't be in the financial situation that I'm in. You fill it in. If only. You see, we tend to think of salvation as something that comes as something that comes just on this side of the grave. Martha 
wasn't the only one feeling this way, though. In verse 37, if you look on down, it says, uh, uh, some of the Jews are, are talking amongst themselves. And, and they're saying, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? In other words, even the crowd is saying, they're not just Martha's question, but even the crowd is talking, they're, they're questioning. If he, would he not, if, if he would have been here, he would have done something. So then the question is, if God can, then we ask, then why didn't he? Why hasn't he intervened? Why didn't he intervene? See, we've all got these ideas. We're not going to do it, but it'd be really neat, <coughs> excuse me, to start here and go around the room and and kind of just talk this through some. Because we've all got these ideas of what Jesus should do for us. I bet all, if we really just had an open conversation this weekend, I bet we all kind of have this idea of what we think Jesus should do for us. And usually, always, with no exception, and I bet, again, what we think he should do for us is just something temporary. It's a temporary fix. It's temporary ideas. In other words, it's just something for the here and now. It's the earthly. And see, Jesus is always thinking beyond. Jesus is a visionary. He's always thinking beyond. It's so hard for us, again, to get excited when we talk about eternity, when we talk about heaven, because there's so much we say we don't know about heaven. Therefore, again, we don't get excited about it. But there is so much in Scripture, if we'll just look, that actually God has given us a glance into how amazing heaven is. But again, because it's something out there that we think we can't really discuss or we can't know about, we don't get excited about it. But see, Jesus is thinking so much farther than that. If you look back at verse 23, Jesus said to, to her, he's speaking to Martha, he says, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. See, she thinks Jesus is just saying what so many say at a, a, at a funeral. He is in a better place. He's gone to be with the Lord. I'll, I'll see him again one day. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Verse 25, get this. Here it is. Circle it, underline it, highlight it, put it in your outline, or write it down in your notes. Look what he said. He said to her, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he says, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Jesus is saying very clearly here, I am God. I am not just a great teacher. I am not just some prophet. I am God. Then he goes on to say, I am the life. And the Bible teaches that everything that we need for real life, for real living, is actually found through Jesus. And so often, that is contrary to what we hear in today's society and culture. We hear today, well, you need this. You have to have this. Uh, to accomplish, to live life, for life to live to the fullest, you need all these things in life. There's even debates now about different things we need. Well, you need this education. No, you need this education. No, you got to have this. Gotta... So well, this is what we're all trying to figure out in our lives. As you 
get older, you got to have this, you got to have all this laid out for you. That's where true happiness, that's where true fulfillment is going to come from. So what do we do? We spend most of our lives chasing after those things. And Jesus makes it very clear. You cannot find it apart from me. You go hunt for it. You go find it. You go there. You do all those things. You cannot find fulfillment apart from me. He says there's a lot of cheap substitutes. There, there are things that will give you these temporary fixes, that will give you these temporary ideas, that will give you these temporary feelings, these things that are going to make you feel good, these things that are going to make you think that you got it all together. But true life is found in Him alone. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. In other words, I am the only one who gives eternal life salvation. In other words, I hold the keys to death. And then he asked Martha. Look at Jesus. He asked Martha. He says, do you believe this? Now, again, let's put ourselves there. You're, you're, let's put, put yourself in the shoes of Martha or in the sandals of Martha. You're there. All that you're having this dialogue with Jesus, and then Jesus says, Martha, do you believe this? So you're there. We're here this weekend. So let me ask, do you believe this? Do you really believe this? I'm not talking about what you were taught as a child that you kind of walked through life with. I'm not talking about what your spouse has, and you, your spouse agree on sort of things like that. I'm not talking about what you heard your grandparents teach you, so therefore, I'm not talking about from a friend or a neighbor. I'm talking about, do you personally believe that Jesus is one whom he says he is, that I am the resurrection, that I am the life? Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that the tomb is empty? Do you really believe that Jesus is risen from the dead? Do you really believe that we serve a living God? And if you say I am, then does your life reflect that? Do your decisions reflect that? In verse 27, she says, here's her, here's her response. She says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And look what transpires next. This is so important. This is, don't miss this. This is so important because this, this has everything to do, I believe, with her answer. See, a lot of times when you're saying, we all say, we, we believe it, we say that Jesus is risen from the dead, we celebrate it. But here's the thing. When we really truly, when God calls for us, when God desires, God has a plan. He has a plan for you, He has a plan for me. And when we are willing to say, I believe in you, and I'm going to follow you no matter what, no matter what you're calling me to do, no matter, no matter what you're asking me to do, no matter what you're asking for us as a church, I will follow. Look what it allows us to experience. Look what Mary got to experience. Martha got to experience. Look what Mary got to experience. Look what everybody around. Look what transpires. It says Jesus walks over to the tomb and he says, take away the stone. The stone is removed. And in verse 43, Jesus called in a loud voice and said, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped, wrapped with strips of linen and cloths around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Do you put yourself there? Put ourselves there. Do you realize what's transpired? Martha said, I believe that you are who you see. Or I believe you are. I am the resurrection and life. I believe. And because of that, they got to experience a miracle. They got to experience a miracle.
Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me will never die. Will never die. For a lot of us, if we're really honest with ourselves, that makes us feel uncomfortable. Because maybe even for us, we'd say we're not, you know, specifically for the world, society, but if we allow ourselves to really think about it, it sounds like it's really very exclusive, if you will. But here's the thing. My mind works in a very simple way. And, and maybe simpler than it should, actually. Yeah, but it, it, it's a, it's, here's the thing with Jesus. Show me someone else who has walked out of his own grave, and then I'll be willing to talk about Jesus. You show me someone else, whoever it is, show me someone else that has risen from the dead, and we'll talk about Jesus. But until then, I'm going to follow him. Whatever he asks, whatever he wants, wherever he wants me to go, even if it's in Eden, North Carolina. Are you willing to go wherever he wants you to go? To do whatever he wants you to do? Because he is the great I am. He is the resurrection and the life. And no one can come to God except through him. Won't you stand with me?